Welcome to Downtown Sports. My name is Downtown Stephen Brown, and in today's video, guys, I would like to go through the Maple Leafs' offseason thus far and kind of give Kyle Dubas a report card. And how I'm going to be grading Kyle Dubas on this offseason thus far is talking about what their goals and needs were going into this offseason and then talking about the individual trades and signings to see whether or not they accomplished what they wanted to. So what were the Toronto Maple Leafs' goals going into this offseason? Well, obviously, we have this quote from Kyle Dubas on October 5th here, saying that it's a priority for the Leafs to become harder to play against. Another thing that I think that we can all agree on is that they wanted to improve the defensive core. But in order to accomplish those two things, the Toronto Maple Leafs needed to make some moves first to clear out some cap space. So before we talk about the defensive core and whether or not it's better compared to last season, let's touch on the first one here. Is this projected opening night lineup harder to play against than what the Maple Leafs had in Game 5 versus the Columbus Blue Jackets? And this was the Maple Leafs lineup versus the Columbus Blue Jackets in that game five. And I mean, Jake Muzzin was obviously injured. You can substitute him in for Martin Berenson. But when you're comparing this lineup to what we showed previously, I think we can all agree the Maple Leafs definitely do have some more toughness and some more grit and some players on here that will push the competitive play. And that obviously starts with Wayne Simmons, who was already quoted on saying that he's going to be punching people's head off. And then it kind of evolved into Zach Bogosian, who we all know how mean and crude he can be along the boards and in front of the net. According to his Hockey DB page here, Jimmy Vesey's listed at 6 foot 3 and 202 pounds, so he's not a small forward who's going to get pushed around. And this is a guy who put up 16 goals, 17 goals, 17 goals, and I'm not going to judge him too much on how he played on the very depressing 2019-2020 Buffalo Sabres. And I don't think I talked about this as much as I should have in my Joe Thornton video that I did yesterday, but the man is 6 foot 4, 220 pounds. I'm not expecting him to come in and be an agitator or a fighter at 41 years old, but he's definitely not going to be a guy that's going to take anyone's shit or get pushed around. This is from a game last December here, and you can see Thornton kind of poke at Mrazic, and Mrazic just swings his stick at him, and Joe's not going to take crap from anybody. He just kind of he kind of punches him, and Mrazic kind of flops over. I don't know if he just fell down easy to draw a call there, but... That's the attitude that Joe Thornton's going to bring to the Toronto Maple Leafs. He's not going to take your shit or anyone else's. And of course, we already know how much of a badass Jake Muzzin is. I don't need to tell you about that. Now, I'm not expecting this team to lead the league in fighting majors like the 2012-2013 team did, but I think we can all agree that, yes, this team is tougher and harder to play against than what it was last year. When speaking about the defense stylistically here, I would like to see them go out and get another top four defenseman. They went out and got a guy like TJ Brody who ranks 32nd here in terms of expected goals above replacement when looking at all defensemen over the past two seasons. I saw some people comparing TJ Brody to Jay Gardner and those people couldn't be more wrong because at Jordan here from Editor and Leaf points out, he's got an incredibly active stick as Brody ranked 8th the past two seasons in takeaways among all defensemen. And he also notes that he's pretty good at getting the puck out of his own zone as he ranked 9th lowest in defensive zone turnover rate out of all defensemen last year. So from what it sounds like, TJ Brody is a guy who likes to carry the puck a lot, and so does Morgan Riley. So maybe that doesn't make them the greatest fit playing together because there's not enough puck to go around between the two of them. But that could also be an argument for pairing these guys together because that gives the Maple Leafs breakout options on either side of the ice. And that would stop teams like the Boston Bruins from targeting the Maple Leafs' right side like they did for years in the playoffs, just dumping it in and constantly attacking guys like Ron Hainsey, Roman Polak, and Nikita Zaitsev. But the reason why I would like the Maple Leafs to acquire another top four defenseman is because whoever doesn't get TJ Brody, I don't want that guy to be stuck babysitting someone else. I don't want Morgan Riley or Jake Muzzin to have to prop up one of Justin Hole or someone else. I want someone playing with them that's going to let them be better, that's going to make them better rather than the other way around. I don't want to put too much on Miko Leighton in right now, but he could potentially be a guy to do that. 
I don't want to put too much on Travis Dermott either because he might be traded. I mean, Chris Johnson said on the most recent edition of the Steve Dangle podcast that the Maple Leafs are definitely shopping one of Hull or Dermott, but potentially both of them. People from Finland and people who watch the KHL on a regular basis are already saying that this guy is a top four defenseman in the NHL right now. And I mean, before he signed with the Toronto Maple Leafs, he was touted as the best player pro defenseman not playing in the NHL. There's no doubt that Travis Dermott has top four talent. It's it's up here. It's the decision making that sometimes eludes him. So playing Travis Dermott in top four minutes on the right side with Jake Muzzin, I think that Jake Muzzin would be doing the babysitting. Travis Dermott might not be very good defensively in his own zone, but he is very good at defending off the rush. He's very good at cutting guys off and not giving them lanes to the net. And he's not afraid to be feisty. He's not afraid to be physical and maybe playing him with a guy like Jake Muzzin. Maybe it benefits him in the long run. If they can find someone better, they can find someone better. If Leighton in steps in and proves that he can be better, fine. Um, they got options, and I will say that this Maple Leafs defensive core is better than what it was last season. It will be better than what it was last season, but there's still room for improvement. So if you're not moving out a guy like Kerfoot, there's not really too much money up there to go out and get another defenseman, which is why I'm okay with just moving one of Travis Thurman or Justin Hull, and I think that guy ends up being Justin Hull. So I'm going to be giving Kyle Dubas part marks on his efforts to improve the Maple Leafs defensive core because he has improved it, but it's going to be a kind of wait and see game with guys like Travis Dermott, Mika Leitinen, and even Rasmus Sandin because there's not really enough money to go out there and add another top four guy unless you're moving on from a guy like Kerfoot. And I don't think that there's anyone left on the market or available via trade that could replace Kerfoot adequately. So you'd be missing out and losing out on a lot in terms of your center depth. So the last thing that we're going to be talking about here is the Maple Leafs' depth, their bottom six, because he did move out Andreas Janssen and Kasperi Kapanen, and that is subtracting away a lot of offense. But like we said, that bottom six is tougher to play against. It makes the team more competitive. It makes them harder to play against. But you still do need adequate depth scoring, and that was a problem for the Toronto Maple Leafs last season with guys constantly injured in and out of the lineup and underperforming. Looking at the Maple Leafs lineup from that game five against the Columbus Blue Jackets, for argument's sake, let's just flip-flop McKayev and Kapanen. So if we're looking at the expected goals above replacement from those six players here in what would be the Maple Leafs' bottom six under normal circumstances, it adds up to be 9.8. And if we're looking at the six players and what they add up to be in the armchair GM that we've been using thus far, it adds up to be 8.1. But when we're analyzing the cap hit, the difference in money spent on the bottom six there from this past season to what it would be in my armchair GM, there's a very, very big difference in how much money they're spending. So when you look at how much money the Maple Leafs spent on their bottom six last year compared to this year, I think Kyle Dubas did an excellent job at bringing in guys on very good value contracts. The quality of the players aren't the same, but the money and the value that they're getting from those players is going to be a lot better. And now I know you've probably been yelling at me all video long, why don't you have a guy like Alexander Barabanov in there? Why don't you have Pierre Engvall? Where's this guy? Where's that guy? Well, I'll explain myself now. We still have no idea what next season is going to look like, and I did a video talking about why I think having all of this extra depth is a really good thing for next season. So the reason why I left those couple of players off the roster is because they're exempt from waivers. You don't need to trade anyone. You don't need to trade Pierre Engvall. He's exempt from waivers. You can just send him down and... Um, yeah, they're hit with a little bit of a penalty here. I think the cost to bury them is like 175 grand, but I would rather have 175 grand count against the cap and have a guy like Engvall who can kill penalties in play center than not have him at all. And what are they going to get for him? A fifth, a sixth, a seventh round pick? What's that going to do? So if we're looking at the three things that we touched on in this video in terms of team toughness or being harder to play against or more competitive, however way you want to phrase it, they accomplished that. In terms of improving the defense, I gave them part marks because they did improve it, but 
It still does need improvement. There's still question marks in some places. In terms of retooling and reshaping the bottom six and creating more depth for the team, full, full marks. So when you consider all of that, I'm going to go ahead and give Kyle Dubas a solid B plus on his report card. And just because I'm giving Kyle Dubas a B plus with a little bit of room to improve, depending on how the defensemen that they have develop, doesn't mean that this team is perfect. It doesn't mean that they are Stanley Cup contenders. There's still huge question marks with Frederick Anderson. Does improving the defense will definitely help Anderson, but him on his own, he was not good last season. And if you can't admit that, that's the bias on you, not on me. I'm not being overly critical of Anderson because I don't know what the hell games you were watching from January onwards. He was objectively bad. The defense was also bad, but so was Anderson. Um, the, those two things can be true. But we've had this conversation multiple times in the past. I'm willing to give him the benefit of the doubt. I mean, he's played a lot over the last four years or so. He's faced a lot of high danger, high quality scoring chances over the last couple of years. You know, um, it's kind of like being upset with your one friend that's always there for you for the one time that he's not. I'm willing to give him the benefit of the doubt. But it's still a question mark. But let me know what you guys think down in the comment section. What grade would you give Kyle Dubas thus far this offseason? What's your favorite trade or addition that the Maple Leafs have made thus far? Let me know. And make sure to leave me a like on that video if you did like it and subscribe for more because more is always on the way. And guys, I'm really liking the looks of things so far.